A couple videos ago, we were talking about uh, how we tune a headphone. One thing we didn't really cover in depth because, again, we don't want to bore people. But mm. you know, to be a little more specific about um, you know the process of developing a particular sound, and I you know I think you could go back decades and look at any company that's been in business that makes audio gear, loudspeakers. You know, I would say for the most part, I said, I think when, you know, you get to a good 10 plus years if you survive that long as a company, and especially if you get out 20, 30, 40 years, right? You typically have a house sound. Like, I mean, models vary over time. I'm sure if you went back, if you were in business 30 years, right? You went back 30 years, I'm sure that speaker or whatever sounds way different than the current one. Right. right. And there's a reason for that, which is what we want to cover here. There's reasons for that. Yes. Okay. Lots of reasons. And I, I think part of the problem is that, you know, people don't really understand, don't know that, they don't understand, they don't know that history because a lot of them weren't around when speakers were made in the 80s. Well, yeah. <laughs> they never heard them, you know, <laughs> unless you buy used, old, used speakers. Well, you could do that. But I think the thing is, yeah, they don't sound the same, but they usually are always going in the same direction. Like they were started on a path. Yeah. You know, and like you could sort of get an impression of why the thing sounds like the previous models or whatever. Um, I think overwhelmingly this is due to kind of the philosophy behind the company, the products they make and stuff like that, the design language. Because overwhelmingly, when a product is actually manufactured, it needs to be made in some manner of ways. And usually there's preferences inside the company for we like doing this for this reason. We like making it in this manner or with these materials or whatever. And these types of decisions influence the sound to some extent, and yeah, especially but, in headphones. But see, that's the point. Like, you know, like, for example, like, you know, behind us are all these various reference curves that everyone, you know, target curves that yep. people have come up with over the years. Right. And, um, you know, the reality of it is, is that, though, when, when, you, when you design a product, whether it be a speaker or a headphone or whatever, you have the designers, the company, tends to pick a direction. They have a direction. They have a focus. Well, you and, hope. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And see, that's what comes with experience over time, right? I think, I think new companies don't typically have as much of a focus as it's those. less clear. Uh, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, you you know, got to find your you way. You hone in. Right? And, and, you know, see, that's the thing. Like, it's, it's not... It's not like us as a company is choosing necessarily the only ones looking at this, choosing a direction. We're looking at how customers perceive the sound. We're looking at what they're listening to. We're looking at where they use our products, how they use our products, mm -hmm. the electronics they're using it with, the type of music they're listening to. And I mean, you know, that's where, that's where being in business for a very long time puts you in a position where you, you have a better idea what a reference should sound like relative to the overall market. And, you know, and I think where I was getting with that is that when you look at all these different target curves, whatever, people, where people are saying, well, this is what you should conform to, the reality of it is when you're making speakers or anything that's designed to play back sound and a human is listening to it, right, there's some artistic intent there. Just as there is with the guys that are laying down the sound, recording the sound, and mixing and mastering, and there's an artistic intent. And so they're not following really any reference curve. I mean, they know from experience, right, the levels to set for various instruments, right, mm -hmm. stuff like that. But the mastering guys are still have artistic intent. In the end, it's they're after a certain sound. Yeah, that's true. I mean, a lot of, a lot of them, they, they always sound the same. Like 50 years later, they're still kind of have that same sound they go for, you know. Like, and people, like, gravitate towards it. Like, oh, I, I either like how this guy mastered stuff or oh, I don't like how he masters anything, you know? This it's is the kind of preference. thing yeah. that's not really well vocalized, but I think is relatively common in almost every industry. There's always some sort of initial ideas. There's some sort of concept you want to convey or whatever. It could be in anything, right? And you start doing it, and then you get feedback. doesn't matter what it is. You always get feedback, right? And you kind of... Try to take this feedback and you try to understand how important this particular thing is over this or whatever. Well, you, you average you, it out over time. Yeah, you average and you weigh it based on um, sort of your internal perceptions of these things. Um, and you try to use this to improve over time because all everyone is trying to do is make a better thing. Just like people who are recording the music and the, the mixing and mastering engineers are doing for – they're trying to figure out – how will people appreciate this music, this track, mm -hmm. this album? And they're adjusting it. They're compensating the same way. They, they have to. 
You can't just do the same thing for 40 years and expect it to work it because the environment around you shifts. People yeah. change their tastes. The music is a different type of music. Well, yeah. We're not listening to the same music today that we were in the 70s. Oh, no. Absolutely well, not. some people yeah. are. Well, okay, I am. You okay. could literally be li but, literally playing the same record. Okay, fine. And I, and but, I gravitate, yeah. and I will gravitate toward electronics and things that, like tube gear, that tailor to sound toward, like, the way that stuff was recorded. It was recorded on tape. It was probably tube bass gear. And I'm, I, love, I love playing it back that way, which makes sense, right? Just as when people listen to more modern stuff, they're looking for beefy solid state sound fast impact you know they want to hear the dynamics all that it's and and, and and i think somewhere we're all in the same boat we're all looking for the same thing it's just we have different focuses but yeah. that's that's where the artistic intent comes in on like with our company when we develop a new product or when we're developing new drivers and, or whatever or the, just the acoustics of it you know we're we have to average all this stuff together i mean if you want to do it right you know if you mm -hmm. want to just randomly like make stuff well, that's easy i mean anyone could do that that's 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 easy you know well it did help um after the uh, 10 years now mr was i wouldn't say the easiest but we had the clearest like goal in mind of exactly what we we're looking for and we hit it right on i think like for, pretty easily yeah because you know? we had data points like we yeah. had models prior to it we knew how we designed those we knew their frequency response we knew what they sounded like ourselves and then we put it out there to the world and let people listen to it and listen to what they were hearing, mm -hmm. the way they absorbed music. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, again, we're not going to do anything dramatic, like change, you know, dramatically shift. But the point is that we can fine tune from there. And that's what we've been doing for years. Well, you look at something like a YouTuber. The goal is typically to get views. And how you do that, of course, varies by the YouTuber. It depends on what kind of videos you're making and who you're serving them to and, you know, whatever, your design intent with this as well. But if the goal is views with it, as a YouTuber, you're going to try to dig out information from a video that performed well and say, why did this work well? You're going to dig through the analytics and say, there's a little spike here and retention, a dip here, whatever. Yeah, if you're serious, you're analytics are key. It. You're going to try to figure out what caused this video to perform. Well, how do you maximize your income? Right. What caused this video to perform where this one did it, right? And you use this information going forward. And someone like Jimmy of Mr. Beast, he's a great example of this. He, he seems to focus a great deal on the analytics. And there's plenty of people that do this across industries. And at pretty much every industry, that's always what it is. You have to react to your audience perceptions because you always have an idea, but you should never assume you're right and you're perfect, right? It, that's just pure art in that sense then. But if you need to commercialize this art, people need to think it's perfect too. So you need to make sure across the average and the totality of circumstances, people like it. And with headphones, what that means is you need feedback. You need to see, this is what we thought we were going to do. This is the headphone we thought we were making. How do these people perceive it? What do they think? Well, it we're talking like. about these people are the people that actually paid for it. Yeah. I mean, that, impressions that's, that's, the, that's the litmus test is like, oh, you bought it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, well, did you you assume you like and then it. over time, how did you enjoy it? Do you still enjoy right. it? And then if you don't, what what about it don't you like? What what improvements or what changes would you prefer to see? And it's not like, you know, any one of those is um, you, you could point at any one of them and saying, oh, we did it because he said so. It doesn't work like that. Right. You right. have to average it. And, you know, and again, that average has to go ag agree with what we perceive ourselves, what we hear, because we have decades of experience listening to music. It's a very heavily weighted average, yeah. I should know. Because yeah, totally. An impression at a show is totally different than an impression from a customer. And in some ways that's good, some ways that's bad, but you gotta assume the customer bought the headphone, they probably somewhat like it. So there's a bit of bias there. So you need to sort of take all these things out of the equation. You gotta understand the whole totality. And it depends on the price point, depends on the time of year even to some extent, like everything matters in these things. So it is very complicated if you want to come up with a perfect formula for the perfect headphones. Just like staring down analytics and YouTube. Yeah, it's or, near impossible. Yeah, it's, it's like any company, you know, you're look, some, some met, you have to look at metrics mm -hmm. with any company and go, well, you know, and I mean, in our case, we're trying to, we're trying to make the best sounding stuff we can as perceived by the consumer who's purchasing them. Right. I mean, that's important to understand. I mean, a lot of people are saying, well, why don't you make a really cheap headphone? All right, okay, okay. Now that's a whole different person. I'll give you the hot take on that one. Oh. Here's the honest truth, it's a secret. Mm. We don't make, right now, we don't make a few hundred dollar or cheap headphones um, because we think there's companies out there doing it better than we could do. True. And that's it. 
Like it's, they're geared for that. Yeah. yeah, they just do a better job. So we could make a few hundred dollar headphone. I don't see it being competitive. I think there's companies doing it better than we yeah, could. I agree. So that's a simple answer, well, but that's the honest truth. Not only that, in terms of the marketplace, it's an extremely crowded area. Super competitive. And, and, and you know, mainly because that kind of stuff can be stamped out in overseas, mainly in China. Yeah. By yeah. the millions. Yeah, we couldn't do the volume required. They, they I mean, got that down where they, yeah. you know, injection mold the parts, snap it together. Everything's optimized to just slam it together, mm -hmm. minimum costs. Well, it has to be. You know, <laughs> print print a million boxes to go in. You think about all the stuff. That, and you got, you know, you got a certain scale there where you can actually, if you're making a buck a piece, you might make some money on it. <laughs> yep. You know, but from a little company like ours who invests all this time and money and effort to try to make something that's really, really good, it's a completely different direction. We talked about this in an older video, but you know, and, and it's not to say we won't make something lower cost at some point, but it can't be this. It's not possible. We try to do what you know? we're good at, and yeah. we're right now we're not good at making a few hundred dollar headphones. That's just not what we do. We can't. We're just like, not set up for that. I think at all. aspirationally, it would be nice to be there one day. Everyone, especially as a designer or a manufacturer, you want to have your product in the hands of a lot of people, and that's sort of the goal of things like this, these curves. It's like, the idea is how you figure out how to make this product appeal to a wide range Agreed. of audiences. That's the whole concept, yeah, right? And I think someday we'll figure out how to trickle this down and mass produce it, yep. you know? But but not today because, you know, that it, it, it degrades from our current direction. And, you know, bottom line though is that, you know, what I want, the other thing I want to mention too about the, the curves behind me and stuff too is that every one of these is someone's idea of how a headphone should measure on a test head, right? It's, it has nothing really to do. Hmm? There's more to it than that, but yeah. yeah. Okay, it's more there's complicated. A, yeah. Yeah. But every, so each one of these, someone created saying, this is how a headphone should measure on a test head or whatever. But, you know, what, 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 what we're trying to tell you with all this, with what we do is that somewhere in between all of these lies what we do. And it's our, artist, our, it's our artistic intent, right? It's, it's, it's our way that we adjust the sound of these products to meet what we feel is our current marketplace. And it's somewhere in between all of these. And it's not going to, it's highly unlikely it'll exactly line up with any one of these or any one of these in the future. And, uh, you know, and it's because that's not what we're after. Well, as we just explained above, right? It's not what we're doing. I think an easy way to look at it is the product actually has to physically exist, has to be made. There's always some sort of difficulties and compromises that make it hard to exactly conform to one of these targets. You could EQ to extremely close, but to manufacture a product without EQ or some sort of... A um, passive headphone. Right. Yeah. Completely passive is very, very challenging. And beyond that, there's usually not a lot of reason to do so. But we could do it. Like oh, we, yeah. We I would, could do I would it. like to do that. We yeah. could get really close to you it. You could get very, sure. very close. But the reason we don't try to do that is because that, in the end, we've done, we could do it. But in the end, it isn't the sound we're after. That's no. the problem. You know, so to what end is this? I mean, we, could, we, we know how to adjust any part of this freaking frequency spect spectrum on a headphone. We could get there. No problem. But when we start to approach these things... It's not where we want That's to It's not be. the sound you want. No. So, yeah. I mean, to what end? I mean, what are, who are we trying to prove? Not only that, you probably are making compromises and other things. But Always. It? Well, everything's a compromise. Always. Everything's a trade-off. Yeah, you, you, you adjust one thing, and now you got to adjust something else. You know? If you think of everything as sort of like a, like a number, if you, if you look at all these different sections of the frequency response, for example, and you say, like, how close am I here? How close am I there? And if it's a Pretty little close. off, maybe you take a point away. And if it's really close, you add a point or, or whatever. There's a lot of times where like taking a point away here, putting a point over there causes some issue somewhere else. So how I try to view things is the totality of the circumstances. You try to deliver the most points possible, the best product possible, where across the average of the spectrum and the totality of the headphone, it's the most enjoyable, most positive experience possible to the end user. Well, and to... Basically, what you're saying is that if you if you can't really key in in any one area of this of these graphs, right. because again, when you say totality, it means so. What is the overall sound of this thing? Mm. Like if it's if it's got a thicker bass response, right? Maybe you can have a couple dB higher mid range in the mid is area. Moreover, that maybe people doesn't prefer that because yeah, right. right, right. It may actually sound better because. The rest of the range is in a different range, you know. Right. Even though it looks like this, it might be elevated relative to other areas. So, 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's what that's what our job is is to you know to look at the overall big picture and produce a, a product that sounds good, really good, you know. And I, I don't know, hopefully that covers it. I guess it's, I, I think that digs into more. I, don't know. I think a way to look at it is you look at these various measurements. They're sort of almost like a confidence inver- interval radiating out of that. And a lot of people look for an exact alignment of a target. That's probably not the best way to go about it. That That's not likely to give people the most desirable result. I'll, I'll tell everyone a secret. Yeah. Another se- two a secret. Two secrets. This is a real secret. Oh, no. All right. We have our own in-house response curve. Oh, oh do we? Yep. Yeah. And if anyone wants to know what it is, mm-hmm. all right, let's t- let's pick on something. Oh. They take a they take the Diana TC, right, mm-hmm. and put it on a 50, 20, 51, 28 test head oh. and measure it. Mm-hmm. That's our in-house response. Oh, <laughs> it pretty much is. Though. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little it's silly not, thing it's to not say. It's not really a secret. No. But there, if anyone wants it, if oh, all it's you need hiding is, in plain sight. Uh, that's right. All you, well, need you just need the equipment. Yeah. yeah, and and you measure it, and that's our target response. Well, it's code. published on the website. Plus or yeah. minus. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. yeah, there is a published. Version now our other models right. vary around that, but right, and it's published. Yeah, that's true. You can look on our website. <laughs> yeah, so I guess you don't need it. If you go to the if you go to the Diana TC page, we do publish measurements. If you go to, our, I should probably mention it, if you go to any of our product pages, like Diana MR, the new model, Diana to C, TOS6, we publish measurements. So, so on, on on our gear here, our, our test gear. So, yeah, it's not it's no secret. Oh, it's it's we've been doing it's that for years, but for some reason people keep commenting, where's the measurements? Yeah. yeah. Well, They've been there for years. Yeah. I guess no one goes to the website. Go to the website. Yeah. <laughs> Why go to the manufacturer's website? When you go? Yes. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, that should cover it. If anyone has any questions about this or whatever, you're welcome to throw something down in the comments. We'll mm-hmm. respond as quickly as possible. Um, email us. Yeah, we read these things. Call and if us. there's anything interesting, we'll yeah. respond or make a video even. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because we're always looking to expand on things that need to be expanded upon, which is right. seems to be never-ending. Well, that's part of this <laughs> loop here, right? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. here we sort of have a general agreement, but out there it's hard to know what's going on. Well, right? yeah, you don't know. So they tell about. us, and now we know, yeah. and we could address it. Yeah. Right. That's like the whole point. Yeah. As some people would say, easy peasy. Something about lemons. Mm. Lemons. Yeah. Okay. Take care, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Thumbs us up. Subscribe because we got more stuff coming.